Hey guys, <laughs> welcome to another episode of the Claywright Workshop. All right, for those who tuned in last time, my faithful viewers, we of course were working on the elephant, like you see right over here to my left. All right, last week I showed you how to make the body and the legs, and I said if y'all tune in this time, I will show you how to do the head. Now, strangely enough, the head is simpler to do than the uh, we talked last time about that we're doing the African elephant. This is an African elephant. It has the ears that are shaped like the continent of Africa. The body slopes down in the back. There's a dip here in the neck. It has the head is lower. It doesn't have the lower lip. I gave a little history of elephants, such as the African elephant has five toes on the front, four on the back. The tusks are actually teeth. They can weigh to about 100 pounds. And with the trunk, if it stands on its hind legs, it can reach a height of 23 feet. Now, what I'm going to do, break right away. Last time it was called Elephant 1. This time it's Elephant 2. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to make a large piece of clay representing the ears, one shape. Then I'm going to make the entire head, the rear round part of the head, and the trunk in one shape. Then I will add the details, which would be, of course, the long tusk and perhaps the eyes. So there's actually less parts on the head than there is on the body. Now, if we get really good, things go well, I will try to connect the head to the body that we made last week. The best place to begin is in the beginning. The beginning, the beginning. Now, I've cut a slice of white earthenware. And I've got to remember that this is not going to be this that big. So I'm going to go a little smaller. We see here is quite often I have the clay roughly the thickness of a slice of white bread. And I'm going to thin it out even more. I'm working it left and again right. Now as I mentioned, quite often people wonder why are artists the smartest people in the world, the most mustard. It's because we see things the way they really are. Okay, we're visual thinkers. Now, these are the two rear ears, the back of the head. So all I have to do is pull it up here in the middle Remember, on an African elephant, it has the larger ears, and they're roughly about like, they look like the continent of Africa, which is bigger at the top and narrower at the bottom. Now, what I'm going to use is one of my favorite tools. This is a wooden stick. Holding one end, I put in, it has serration marks here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to radiate out, and I'm going to make those wonderful textures on the edge of the ears. Now, as I've mentioned, African elephants, and Indian too, as far as that goes, when they flap their ears, it is a way of cooling their body. The blood goes through the thin ears, and by flapping them, it cools them, and they're able to maintain their body heat that way. Now, quite often when I'm doing this, and I'm out visiting public schools and so forth, the children are very surprised how quick and easy this goes. But I am a professional artist and what we sometimes call a production artist. So I've come up with tricks and techniques that speed me up. Now, those were the ears. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to make the head ball shape and the trunk out of one piece of clay. So therefore, to make this complicated head, I will only need two pieces of clay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to taper this so it is bigger on one end and skinnier on the other. And the way that I do that is by putting more pressure on one end and less on the other. Now, I'm doing two other things you may not notice unless you're one of my uh, regulars. You can catch me as I'm letting my hands pull apart, that'll stretch this. Okay, now, I want this end bigger. 
So I'm going to press down. Now, I was telling uh, the, earlier that the, el the legs in the elephant's bones are very, very uh, strong, the bones in his legs, per se. But his head bone, the leg bones, don't even have marrow in them to make them stronger. But the head bone has got air in it. The head is so massive that it helps to make it lighter. All righty. Can you see this kind of working already? Now, I need a hollow at this end. It's solid. Now, there's several ways to do it. There's always more than one way. I'm going to use a proctology stick. And this time, I'm only putting pressure on one end. So I'm opening up this mass. Now, it was a bit of a sarcastic joke that artists were the smartest, most well-adjusted people. But the reason that I had the humor, or the attempted humor, was to explain that when I look at something, I see the basic shapes. When I see a birthday cake, I pay more attention to the cake than I do candles. All right? Attention to detail. All right, this is pretty much what I wanted. Now, while I still have it in peace, I'm going to use this tool this time just so those of either classroom teachers a lot send in and ask for copies of the tape and they want to do this in their classroom and I use these simple tools that you can duplicate. The bottom of an elephant's trunk is flat and the top is round so if you sit it on end it look a big capital D. So trust me on this, I'm going to throw it down so it's now flat on the bottom. And I'm going to use the top of this inexpensive magic marker. And I'm going to go back and forth. And this looks so very much like the texture you would encounter on an elephant's trunk. This tool does a really good job. It's very simple. Nobody can hurt themselves. This is just clay, so how difficult it be. And there's pretty nice texture. Now, the end of the elephant's trunk, and we were talking this earlier, it's a fascinating animal. They have between 40,000 and 150,000 muscles in this trunk. And there's two little nostrils there. And the Asian elephant has one little appendage. But the African elephant has two little appendages that work like fingers that allows an elephant to pick a berry or flower and it's strong enough that he can pick up a lion and throw him across the room. Now, these are my two shapes. This is my ear shape. This is my head and trunk shape. I'm going to score and slip. Again, quite often if you say something a lot, you assume everybody's heard you say it. But if you have children, you realize you can say something a whole lot and they still didn't hear you, okay? Or if you're a teacher, you can realize it doesn't make any difference how many times you say there's going to be a test on Friday. Half the class will say they didn't hear you. Okay, now I'm going to put the head in the middle of those ears. Uh, sometimes when you're first starting out, you will make the uh, trunk too long. And on the uh, previous drawing, when the elephant has his head down, the trunk goes to the ground. It doesn't fall along behind him like a snake or anything. It just goes to the ground. Now, I'm going to use a relatively simple tool, and I'm going to make sure that head is well adjusted. One of the problems I quite often have is students get in a hurry, and they get ahead of themselves, right? They have an imaginary friend. They imagine they're further along than they are. Now, I connected the top. We see how it's looking like an elephant head already. Pretty good, all right? Now, I'm going to let that sit just a moment so it can get a little strength. And I'm going to go ahead while it's setting up, and I'm going to roll the tusks. I said that correctly, the tusks. Remember the tusk or teeth? That was why they were hunted to extension. I'm now going to make it pointed on both ends and fat in the middle. This again is a shape that we use quite often. We call it the mustache shape. I'm going to tear it in two so I have two equal pieces. 
and these are going to be my tusks, okay? Now I'm sitting them over here so they can start to stiffen up a little bit. Now I go back to the head. My hand pulls a lot of moisture out of the clay, and so the more that I touch it, the more it will get, and I'm starting to shape it up. Now, as luck would have it, I made last week an elephant body that we're going to put this head on. Now, I've made the body hollow, both ends. Now I have to hollow this out. So there is my hole. So it'll fit on there. Okay? Now, see how simple that was? I'm going to put my eye in using my thumb. I'm going to push my thumb in and up, and it makes a wonderful little eyelid. I wish y'all could have seen that. It came in great. I'm going to try again on this side. I just push my thumb in and up. Perfect little eyelid. Look at that. Now, the elephant, of course, has lots and lots of wrinkles. I'm going to put on that little cheek there. Keep bringing the trunk down so I make it just about the right size. And I can either manipulate this on the inside, and I think that I will. And I'm going to bring that cheek out. It's coming out. And then I move to this side, and I bring the other cheek out, very symmetrical. Big head. All right, there we go. See, we've got the nice cheeks. Now, I'm going to add the whole lower lip that comes out. That's going to be a relatively easy shape. I'm going to roll this, skinny on one end, fat on the other, one end skinny, one end fat, grab the top and the bottom, down like that, and that's the entire lower jaw. We use water, water works like glue, and we add this lower jaw on. Not too bad. Excellent already. See this? Now, everything's looking good. There's an appendage that comes out of the front of the face that holds these tusks in place. I'm putting those on now. All righty, I'll move this over this way so we can see better, hopefully. Two equal pieces. You guys have seen me do this many, many times. I tear that in two, so I have two equal pieces. We use water as our glue. We score a little bit, and now I'll do this side first. Now, I'm working upside down backwards. I read one time, I, I love watching the old Fred Astaire movies, and I think he is just a, a great natural athlete. I mean, the guy's a brilliant dancer, choreographer. And Ginger Rogers said, you know, you guys think Fred... A stare is a good dancer. Bear in mind, I did every step that he did, and I did it backwards wearing high heels. Never looked at it from that point of view before. All righty. Now, I'm kind of doing it backwards, upside down, wearing high heels here. Now, I put the two holes there so as I could stick the elephant ivory right in there. Now, I know you probably thought since uh, the, the head was going to be much more difficult than was the uh, whole body. But you bear in mind, we did the ears, we did the trunk and head attached. And what I'm doing now is putting in the tusks. There was an old bad joke. Remember, the tusks are teeth. The bad joke was, what one word scares elephants more than any other word? Oh, my goodness. And they said, the, a city in Alabama, if you say the name of that city, it really does scare the elephants. And I said, what's the name of that city? And they said, Tuscaloosa. I didn't say it was funny. I just, I just happened to remember that. Okay. Elephants don't want to hear that their tusks are loose. That was why they were hunted so much. Ivory, of course, being very valuable. All righty. Now, 
there is the elephant head. Now when I do these, luckily I'm surrounded by experts, or sometimes known as women and children, and um, they will come up and everybody will tell me, you have to have the trunk up because that represents good luck, and if you have the trunk down, the luck will run out. I don't know about that. I do know that the rule is on horseshoes, you're always supposed to have them up so they don't run out. Now, that was simple enough. We, of course, would just add the head to the body. Now, what I was fascinated by, I gotta move this bear, you notice we made that hollow. What I was fascinated by was when I was research on the elephants and they started telling me the different colors and things that they came in, that there were uh, actually pink elephants, or they appear to be pink, their color is actually a black, gray, brown, but that the elephants used their trunk to put dust on themselves to kill the parasites, and then of course they use water to spray all that off. They're um, homophores, they eat bark and grass, they don't eat small uh, animals or anything. So uh, they have trouble with parasites, etc. They eat 300 pounds a day, which I thought was pretty interesting. Now, what I want to do here so you guys can see is I brought some wood stain. The clay that I use is called white earthenware clay. And this wood stain, we know that we stir it up because the heavier pits sink to the bottom. And let's see if I can... Oh my goodness, I'm happy about this, children. Okay, you're going to start seeing this. Now, this is an acrylic-based stain, or basically water-based. So, I can thin this down with water, and it would not be dark. It also will help it to spread everywhere. What you're seeing now is all of the nice texture that I told you guys about, but white on white, it was kind of hard to see. Now, I appreciate you guys calling me, uh, emails, letters, phones, and making suggestions about what I might could do for the next show. Uh, I, I do listen to all your suggestions whenever possible. Because of the current election going on right now, I thought it would be interesting to do the elephants, which we know is a symbol of the GOP, which stands for the Grand Old Party or Republican Party. And then the next uh, show, I'm going to do the burrow, or donkey, which is symbol of the Democratic Party. Now, a little interesting piece of trivia about that is there was a uh, cartoonist for the New York paper called Thomas Nast, N-A-S-T, Nast. Brilliant cartoonist, artist. And he was the one that came up with the symbol for the elephant for the Republicans and the donkey for the Democrats. All right, well, that'd be a pretty good claim to fame. But when he was doing a design for um, Red Devil Dye Company, he took some old folk tales and so forth, and he created a drawing of the devil for Red Devil Dye Company. And that is the devil that most of us get a visual image of. We're all visual thinkers, right? When somebody says devil, and it was the cloven hoof and the pointed tails and the horn and the red suit. Well, geez, that's a pretty good fame and fortune. Everybody's thinking of Democrats and Republicans, and now they're thinking of the devil, and they're all thinking of this one guy's artwork. But guess what else he did? Coca-Cola asked him to do a picture of Santa Claus. And before then, in Europe, they had been what they call Father Christmas, which was this tall, slender fellow wearing a cape. Uh, the whole concept of the guy in the cape coming around and giving uh, gifts actually started in Turkey, which I thought was interesting. So he came up with the jovial uh, red cheeks and round face and the big belly and everything. And he did that uh, drawing of Santa Claus that all comes to our mind when we think of Santa. Now. As I mentioned about right-brainers, we think in pictures, not words. Einstein said, a famous right-brainer, that words had nothing to do with his thought process. He also said one of my favorite quotes, quotes was that imagination was more important than knowledge. Is that cool or what? Imagination more important than knowledge. Because you can learn 
so much information, but it's only information that somebody else knows. And with imagination, it's endless. If you've ever had a conversation with a three-year-old, you know what I mean. Now, you'll notice that this is getting darker, and the colors keep soaking in. And I'm showing you this so that you will understand it, that clay is very, very absorbent. Now, traditionally, what I have done, and I will do with this elephant, is I will add paint over the top of this, probably a gray-brown, then a little touch of blue, a little touch of gold. Now, I brought an elephant last week, and I'm going to show it to you guys now, plus another one over here, to show you how to decorate. Whenever possible, I teach you some of my techniques about wood stain and paint. Now, when I first do it, you'll see how rich the color is. And I want the color to stay that rich. So it'll have to reach the point it doesn't keep saturating, all right? But I wanted you to see that in the earlier stages because when I say this is the beginning, not the end, and with other people, they will always tell me that's not where I want to end up. And I'll say, you know, if you got in a taxi in New York and told them to take you to the United Nations and the guy pulled out in traffic, you said, this isn't it. And he can't start at the destination. He must start from where he is and move forward. And again, as I've mentioned, right brain people traditionally are not famous for their patience. So when I'm in a room full of people and they're all trying to tell me their ideas, they're wondering, why am I so slow? Because I am trapped in real time. All right, I've done enough of that for you guys to see how quickly the color will change it. I want you to look at this one. It's about the same size head. We can come in on a close-up there. And this is the blue and the gray and the green and the other colors I've mentioned. Now, in this situation, when we already have the color on it, or base color, the wood stain is much more successful in tinting the color, all right? When you add darkness to a color, you're making a shade of that color. When you add light to the color, or white, you're making a tint of that color. So we'll use the words correctly the way artists are supposed to. Look at this. Do you see how much better this looks because I already had the base color on it and now I'm just antiquing it or putting a patina on it. This isn't smell-o-vision, it's television. You guys can't this stuff, but there are several smells I'm very fond of and this is one of them. Fresh cut grass is another. Fresh, fresh baked bread is another. But this is looking good. I am so very pleased with that. Now, just in case you were not tuned in last week, I want to show you one, a little ambitious of me, but I want to show you one I brought from home where I'd made a pot, and then I went back and I sculpted two heads, and I put it on both sides of the pot. So I used a sculpture as decorating. I didn't do an actual sculpture of an elephant. I decorated it. Aha, it's right here. Give me a second. because it's heavy. Now, for those that didn't get to tune in last week, this finish here, and one of the questions I get most often, because you've seen the projects behind me, most people working with clay, they always think you must glaze it. You can use wood stain, house paint, shoe polish, spray paint, glaze, there are many, many creative ways you can decorate. Now, what you're seeing here, and is a very unusual look, is I spray painted this with a gold paint, and then I spray painted it with a copper paint, and then I put the same wood stain over it that you saw us just stain this real nice face right here. Now, can you see how much that stain added to it? Now, I'll be able to wipe this down to get the very shade that I want, and then I will lock it in with a flat um, varnish or epoxy or resin or some way to protect the color. Often this pot will end up on the back porch with a plant in it, as opposed to some of the... 
I will sell to a craft shop or to a collector or something. So that quite often will dictate what sort of color that I use. Okay, well last week we did the body starting with the four legs and the round uh, body itself. And then this week we did the head. So I've got just a minute or two left. I'm going to do some real quick review. So you remember, I know I covered it rather fast on what we did, okay? We rolled out the big butterfly piece of clay. We brought it up here, brought it down there. We then added the large, and I'm going to call it a funnel, and it came down. We put the grooves in the edges of the ears. We put the eye in by using our thumb to press up. Then we used our tool to make the texture coming down the trunk. We put the end where it has the two holes. The Asian has the one finger, the African has the two. We made the tusk separate and then added those on. Now it's interesting to me that I've read that African elephants sometimes will rest their trunk on top of their tusks because the trunk is so heavy. All right, isn't that interesting? Okay. That was how we did the head. We used this neat little tool here to get the texture that showed up on the ears. We also used it here on the trunk. Now all I would have to do now is put in the eyes, which I'll do because it is so quick. They have relatively small eyes for the size of the body. I'm going to roll the eye, put it into the socket. I mentioned the end of the tool had a hollow, so that locks my eye in. Wasn't that quick and easy? Now I'm going to use the other end, and I'm going to begin to put the wrinkles under the eye. Okay, that is all the time that we have for today. Hopefully you guys will tune in next time when I'm going to show you how to make the donkey. So will that be fair to the Republicans and the Democrats? We don't want to leave anybody out. And until then, you got to have art.